I'm a consultant in human rights and equal opportunity, um, especially as it relates to the workplace. We're looking at discrimination, we're looking at vilification beyond simply Indigenous issues, we're looking at religious issues in other communities, we're looking at people of varying sexuality, we're looking at women and the role they play within the broader community and the football community. Bringing these issues together has been one of the great advances that we've done in the last 11 years that I've been involved with the AFL. And there's more of that to bring in and to unify and to get us thinking absolutely correctly about issues of respect. It's a bit of a sense of responsibility. Um, being an Indigenous player, um, you know, some of the players like Michael Long and Nicky Wimmer, they've sort of paved the way for the next generation and I just feel as though if I can help um, you know, push these messages and, and get it across the, the whole league and the, uh, you know, the junior leagues and the state leagues and uh, make it easier for the young Indigenous players to, to come through. Just for the awareness of, uh, for the broader community I guess that racism, vilification isn't uh, a place for sports. The focus on a person's abilities rather than their disabilities in terms of their employment or acceptance within let's say the environment of a club. So we're talking about uh, physical uh, disability, uh, we're talking about disease in, in, some, in some cases like bloodborne diseases like HIV and we're certainly talking about mental health as well. When we seek to abuse someone because of their religious background, uh, when we seek to insult, humiliate or hurt uh, for whatever reasons, uh, we view it in exactly the same way as we view racism. Uh, they are identical in that sense. In my time, uh, very much my expectation that I would be uh, racially abused on the football field. There are instances I, I went out to, to dinner with my sister, her partner and my family and we were walking down the street and a, a guy yelled out in front of them, oh you f faggot. And my 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 mum lost it. My my sister really didn't know how to react. Her partner, he did he wanted to go go bash them and my dad was on another planet. So it's it's still it still really shocks them to hear that, that language. Just recently in the VFL at Port Melbourne, um, and the man said something over the fence. You know that that that, that was a real shock to me. First thing that went on in my head was my kids were at the football ground, and first thing was, did they hear it? Uh, did my family hear it? A little bit of it came into my mind was, I thought we're over this, and I thought we'll be on this. I remember when my little sister, she was starting prep, and you know she come she come home crying a couple of times. She didn't want to go back to school because um, the kids didn't know any better. You know I don't blame them; they're only little kids and you know they were giving her a hard time and didn't want to involve her in the games they were playing obviously because of her skin colour. There was times on the footy field where you know people would call me a, a black such and such and um, you know at the time I, I got a little bit angry and um, retaliated with violence but you know after speaking to my, my father after that he sort of said that you know these people were you know a little bit ignorant they, they don't really understand us and um, you know, it was just a ploy to try and get me off my game. My dad always told me the best way to describe it is racism is a way um, people react to change. So it, it takes a lot of time for people, you know, having these new people coming to their country. You'd get asked the question, you know, are you, are you a faggot? And then denial, denial, denial. Oh, and then they'd be, oh, I didn't think so, oh, thank God, because, you know, I don't think I could be friends with someone who's gay. Whenever I was vilified um, as a youngster, it always felt like the perpetrator was um, trying to say that I was inferior to them. Our, our race was inferior to, to that person, and, um, you know, they were therefore superior to, to me. You know someone who probably is gay and by your lack of understanding or lack of respect or, or lack of 
sort of education, you probably would be offending and alienating them on a daily basis. On the footy field, people can see it as just sledging, but it is so much more hurtful and um, it affects, like it affected me and my family so much because like I said before, our people have been put through so much um, in the past and to have it still happening now, it, it's, it's really, really hurtful and um, you know, it affects us a lot. It's not a reflection of me, it's actually a reflection of them. And it doesn't matter if you're referring to you know, sexuality, religion, race, or whatever it might be, that's, it's a reflection of the person who's, who's casting that, not the actual person it's directed at. I think we've come a long way. Uh, the difference between racial vilification and, and barracking and supporting are two different things. I think, you know, you can say, Chris Johnson, you're a mug, that's no worries, but Chris Johnson, you're a such and such, got to do with my colour or my, or my race is completely different. We've seen the growth now to the Respect and Responsibility Program, which is absolutely standalone and works terrific in those terms of education. And we've expanded the Rule 30 to include sexuality, whether one is gay, uh, heterosexual or bisexual, uh, as a grounds that can't be used to discriminate or vilify, and disability, uh, someone of, ability, uh, of special ability or disability can't be discriminated against. We've worked so hard and we got the message through for quite a while there, um, but uh, still you need to keep rehashing those things and keep reminding people and keep on top of it rather than think that you've done a job and let it slide and, and then it gets into uh, a difficult state. But uh, I think we just need to keep reinforcing and uh, moving towards that uh, there's no uh, racism in sports pretty much. I remember going to a club uh, and this must have been about seven or eight years ago and I'd given my spiel and the players know what I'm talking about and I'd done that and the coach at the time stood up and then gave his two bobs worth and he got up and he said you've heard what Frank's got to say you heard what the AFL say and he said as far as I'm concerned there is nothing as low as someone who uses racist comments or racist language and I won't have it in this club to get a coach to get up and just say those few words, for me is so much more powerful than anything I can ever say. The way we can fight as, as a football community is to make sure that each and every single one of us, each one of us as an individual, picks up our responsibilities. Each one of us as, a, as an individual says no to a friend, that's the hard part, says to a friend no, those jokes aren't funny. That comment isn't right. Once we do that, once each one of us stands up for that, we start to actually increase our chances of winning this battle. I was at the point when after I did come out I was like, well, that really wasn't too bad of a big of a deal. You know, you've got to give people a little, a little bit more credit. And I think today people generally are more accepting and becoming more accepting because they realise that, you know, being gay doesn't mean you're all things that the, the stereotypes or perceptions are, you can actually be a normal person. If I can get one bloke in one club to rethink his attitudes and say to himself, look, maybe I could be wrong the way I've assessed Kuris or the way I've assessed Muslims, then that for me is success and that's what keeps me working. Now that I've I'm in the position that I am now where I'm 100% out. I actually feel bad for, for those people for, for thinking that way. It's just not tolerated anymore. And um, you know, I, I know I definitely don't stand for that sort of thing and, and neither does any of my family. For evil to flourish, all it takes is that good men do nothing. The AFL's vilification policy states that no person shall act toward, engage in conduct, or speak to any other person in a manner which threatens, disparages, vilifies or insults them on any basis. This includes a person's race, religion, gender, colour, their sexual orientation, preference or identity, or special ability or disability. And this includes illness, 
disease or mental health status. Vilifying somebody on these grounds is in breach of this policy. This includes vilifying language or behaviour through all mediums, such as Facebook, Twitter and text messages. The following detail outlines the procedures that will occur in managing a complaint. In the event of a complaint, it is important that the complaint is lodged with the League Complaints Officer by 5pm the next working day after the alleged incident. In the case of an intra-club breach, and that's a complaint within your own club environment, the club's complaints officer will first seek to achieve an informal and confidential resolution where possible within three days. If this isn't possible, or doesn't appear as though it will be possible, the club complaints officer will then refer it to the league complaints officer. In the case of an inter-club breach involving more than one club, the club complaints officer must inform the league complaints officer by 5pm the day after the complaint was lodged with the club. At this point, the club complaints officer does nothing else unless instructed by the league. Following a complaint being lodged, the League Complaints Officer shall determine the process based on the complaint. The process may be informal resolution, conciliation, or send the complaint directly to the tribunal. In all cases, there is an opportunity for the people involved in an incident to reach informal resolution where the matter is resolved privately. After collecting and reviewing the detail, the League Complaints Officer may refer the matter to conciliation, which shall be conducted by an independent conciliator. As is the case through the entire process, confidentiality is maintained at all times. Should the matter not be resolved at conciliation, the League Complaints Officer may refer the matter to the Investigation Officer to further determine the facts. Once a formal investigation has taken place, the Investigation Officer will provide a recommendation to the League Complaints Officer. This may be that there is no case to answer due to insufficient evidence or recommend that the case be heard at the League's tribunal. The League Complaints Officer may accept the investigator's recommendation and the charge will be heard for determination. The tribunal has the authority to make decisions based on available information. At this point, the complaint is resolved. Should either party be unsatisfied with the tribunal's decision on the matter, it may be referred to appeal in accordance with the League's rules. What does a club need to do? A club can promote the rule and procedure to players and members via its website or other forms of communication such as newsletters. It can also provide training to club members via this DVD and must appoint a complaints officer to manage any complaint that may occur. What are the League's responsibilities? After adopting the rule, a League can promote the rule to clubs, participants and spectators via their website and other forms of communication. It can also provide training to League representatives via this DVD. The League will appoint a League Complaints Officer and an Investigation Officer should it be needed. For more information, speak to your club complaints officer, read through the policy and the rule, contact your league or refer to the AFL website www.afl.com.au.